Okay, so we should be live right now. And if so, if you're with us on YouTube, thanks so much. We're really excited to start our Tough Topics Conference. This is the first session of the first time we've tried something like this. So uh, we're very excited for it and excited to un unpack some topics that and our, our prayer is that these conversations for for you guys who are who watch and who follow along and who discuss in in a group or, or however you do that that it will spark uh curiosity in you it'll spark growth in through through just what 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 is um what wakes up in your heart to to discover for yourself and also in the conversations that you have so that's our heart for this and um and we thank you for joining us we're going to be talking tonight um through through the topic of the holy spirit and spiritual gifts and we're excited to get into that just really quickly, I want to talk through some of the some of the format of what's happening tonight. Um, this is going to be kind of a Q&A style thing, and you'll be hearing from our speaker. And the, this entire conference is set up that we want to hear from someone who has uh, both a lot of expertise in an area and a lot of experiences that, that we don't necessarily share and, and try to learn, try to learn from them in that way. And so keep in mind that this is, that's what this is. This isn't supposed to be a debate. That's not our goal to debate, uh, to, to defend any specific view on anything. Um, and our goal isn't to get everyone to agree necessarily either. Rather, it is to learn and to grow from a, from a unique perspective. So with that in mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over now uh, to John, who's going to welcome our, our first speaker. Hey, guys. Yeah, so we are excited to have... Uh, Reverend Dr. Rob Reamer with us today, tonight. He is a professor of pastoral theology at Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack, Kentucky, or I always say Kentucky every time I read that, it's Nyack, New York. Um, and he is the founding pastor of South Shore Community Church in Massachusetts. Uh, Rob is an accomplished author. His book, Soul Care, um, River Dwellers, Deep Faith and Pathways to the King, they've sold worldwide. And Rob regularly speaks at pastors' conferences, leadership conferences, churches, and seminaries all around the world. Rob and his wife, Jen, live in Nyack, New York, uh, with their four children, Danielle, Courtney, Darcy, and Craig. So, Rob, we are super glad to have you. Thanks for joining us. John, good to be here with you. All right. So, quick question. Um, would you just quickly outline the different theological persuasions regarding the work of the Holy Spirit today for us? Yeah, you know, so <clears throat> there are obviously people out there that don't believe that the Holy Spirit continues to do what he did, like in the Gospels or in the Book of Acts. Uh, those would be cessationists. Uh, then there's a group of people out there who would believe in these things doctrinally, like, oh yeah, God still does miracles, he still speaks through the Holy Spirit, etc., but they don't have much practice in those things. So they have a safe but guarded theology. You know, it looks good, sounds good, but there's no practice. Uh, you know, then there's people who have the theology for it and they have a form of practice, but a lot of times it becomes a religious form of practice without the authentic. So, you know, in some contexts, for example, I'll go pray for somebody and they know when a holy person prays for them, they're supposed to fall over. Like that's just a reflex reaction, right? And so that's a learned behavior. That is a religious response to a moment, but it's not authentic necessarily. That can be, but it's not always. And then you have people that are trying to actually live into the spirit and practice it in an authentic way which I think is what I would try to aim for if I was, you know, uh, trying to define myself where I fall in this camp. Yeah, so if you, if you are defining yourself, what kind of language do you use to describe your theological position? Yeah, you know, I was born and raised evangelical, right? So, I mean, we were word-based people who, quite frankly, didn't have a lot of experience in the things of the Holy Spirit. But uh, I had a grandmother who heard God's voice. And, you know, it wasn't uh, wacky. I mean, she had some pretty remarkable stories. Uh, you know, one time my grandfather got shot. It was World War II. She knew the moment he was in trouble. Uh, got a prompting that, it, you know, his life was in danger. 
called the local church, which was an evangelical church. They gathered to pray. They found out it was the exact moment that he got shot. And the bullet missed his heart by a fraction of an inch. I'm convinced if they had, she hadn't gotten that prompting of the Holy Spirit, they hadn't prayed, he wouldn't have lived. So, you know, I had enough of that in my DNA that I had at least some people that actually were walking in the, you know, supernatural a little bit, hearing the voice of God and so forth. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story about your grandma. I know you have a number of stories as well. Um, your theology isn't just, it's not just theoretical, uh, it's practical from reading your book, Soul Care. Um, so could you share a couple of those stories that are, I guess, more typical of some of the stories that you tend to see, whether it's at a Soul Care conference or just in the classroom? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll share one that happened to me just a couple years back. Um, I was actually in a, I was scheduled to speak for a group of missionaries in Turkey. Uh, I was right before the conference started. I didn't know any of the people, hadn't really met them before or anything. And I was with a friend who was actually going to lead worship in this conference. And as we sit down to begin, um, you know, before we get into the room or anything, we're just having a cup of coffee together out in the lobby. And as we're sitting there in the lobby, I said to my buddy, I said, do you see that young blonde woman that just walked across the lobby? I said, she was sexually abused by her father. And I said, uh, if she's one of our missionaries before this week's out, I'll do her deliverance. He looks at me and he goes, how do you know that? And I said to him, listen, I said, if she's our missionary, I'll get her free and we'll confirm the story. And then I'll tell you how I knew it. He goes, I can't wait to see this. So we go upstairs and sure enough, there she is in the room right now. This is a, a European resort. So there was lots and lots of blondes. It wasn't, you know, just like this was the only blonde. So it wasn't a dumb guess or anything. And uh, so we go upstairs and uh, he, of course, no subtlety whatsoever. He looks at me and he goes, let's go talk to her. I'm like, you're not going to go talk to her right away. Give me a break. I said, let's just let, let it unfold. It'll happen. So anyways, uh, you know, I'm doing my very first session. I'm not scheduled to speak about demonic things, deliverance, none of those kinds of topics. Um, and some one of the missionaries raises their hand and said, hey, could you teach us in deliverance while you're here? We've heard you've had a lot of experience in that. Would you be willing to do that? I said, sure. You know, you have Wednesday free. I'll do it Wednesday. Listen, the only person I prayed would show up for that thing. I didn't care who showed up. But the one person I knew needed to show up was that girl that I saw. And so I prayed she'd show up. We go up on Wednesday afternoon. As soon as we walk in the room, the first person that comes in the room is this young lady. And I walked right over to her and I said to her, uh, I said, you are the only person I prayed would show up for this meeting. I said, I don't care who else came, but I prayed you would come. And she said to me, I've been waiting to meet you for 10 years because I've heard about your ministry. And I said to her, can I get super direct really quickly? She said, yeah. I said, you were sexually abused by your father, weren't you? And she said, I was. I said, you are experiencing nighttime demonic attacks where you feel something is sexually assaulting you in the night. You wake up, but there's nothing there, aren't you? She said, every night. I said, how long has it gone on? She said, over 10 years. And I said to her, tonight, was it last night, did that you have that experience? She said, yes. And I said, last night will be the last time you ever have it. Uh, we did her deliverance, got her totally free. And, uh, you know, then my buddy says to me, well, how did you know that? And the answer is, it was a prophetic prompting. It was a leading of the Holy Spirit. What I can tell you is, um, I feel sometimes the collision of two emotions at the same time in my inner being. It is the collision of the father's tender affections. And it's very uniquely and distinctly the father's affections. It's not the Holy Spirit's. It's not Jesus. It's not mine. It's uniquely and distinctly the father's tender affections and his ferocity. And when those two emotions collide in my inner being, I know I'm dealing with someone that's been abused. And in this case, immediately I knew it was her father. And so we got her free and she's never had another one of those nighttime visitors ever again. Wow. That's amazing. Um, could you, could you maybe share one more story? Um, uh, do you have another one that comes to mind right away? If not, that's fine. Sure. Um, I was, uh, 
praying for, well, I was at a conference again, I was speaking and it was actually one of my classes that came with me. I was doing it with the Dean of our seminary. And uh, this young lady was there and uh, he called me, he was leaving for another gig. And so he just called me up and he said, hey, I'm gonna take off now. And I was given the last talk. And he said, would you please meet with this young woman in our class? And he gave me her name and I said, uh, yeah, sure be happy to meet with her. I said, why? He said, she's just stuck. I said, sure. Yeah, man, I'll, I'll be happy to meet with her. Her name's Ruth. I mean, she gave me permission to tell her story. It's in soul care. And so I walked up to her. She was in a room by herself, you know, kind of waiting between sessions. And when I walked in, as soon as I walked in the room, she looks at me and she goes, oh, it's you. She goes, and I said to her, I go, hey, listen, I said, Ron told me he wanted me to talk to you. I said, you don't need to talk to me if you don't want to. She said, it's all right. So I sat down next to her and I said to her, listen, Ron said, you're stuck. And I said, uh, you want to talk about it? She goes, all right. And so I said, tell me what's happening. What's your stuck point? And she said, I don't really feel anything. I said, you mean emotionally? She goes, yeah. I go, okay. So I said, you don't feel sadness. She goes, not really. I said, you don't feel joy. She said, no. I said, you don't feel peace. She said, no. I said, you're kind of flat emotionally all the time. She goes, yeah, that's it. I don't really have feelings at all, hardly ever. I said, okay. I said, tell me your story. Listen, you tell me your story. I'll tell you your symptoms. You tell me your symptoms. I'll guess at your story. You can't divorce life from your story. You just can't, man. What happens to you in your story determines a lot of the issues you struggle with in life, right? So I said, just tell me your story. The biggest part of her story is this. This is the one phrase that kept coming up. She said, from the time she was little, as early as she could remember, her mother would say to her, listen, women are just oppressed. That's just the way it is. It's never going to change. You just need to get over it. She started saying that to her from the time she was a little girl all the way through her years. And she kept repeating that phrase. And I said to her when she finished her story, I said, Ruth, listen, I said, um, when, when you were a little kid and something bad happened, what did you do? And she said, I would sit in my room. And I said, did you journal? She said, no. I said, did you cry? She said, no. I said, did you call a friend? She said, no. I said, did you pray? She said, no. I said, you just sat there. She said, yep. And I said, you just stuffed all the emotions down until they kind of passed. And then you went back into doing whatever it is you were going to do. She goes, yeah. I said, all right, I'm going to give you an image. I said, you, your soul is like a steel box and you're trapped inside this steel box. And I said, Jesus is standing at this door. There's no windows. It's just a steel box. You're locked in there. He's standing at the door and he's knocking and he wants you to let him in. And she looks at me and she goes, he can come in if he wants to. I said, no. I said, you see, your mother told you that men were oppressing women. I said, he's not going to be an oppressor. He's not going to kick the door in. He's waiting for an invitation. He stands at the door and knocks. I said, you've got to open the door and let him in. She looks at me and she goes, I'm afraid. I go, of course you're afraid. I said, you've been, you've been finding out your whole life that men are oppressive. So I said, you need to know first that Jesus isn't like that. He's incredibly tender. Uh, there's a great line about Jesus in Matthew. It says, you know, a bruised reed, he will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. I said, that's just not, he's not like that. And I said, so here's the deal. I said, I'm not going to kick the door in either. I can't anyways, but I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, we got one last session. I said, at the end of this last session, I said, if you want help, you come forward. If not, I said, we'll care for it another day. She said, okay. So I give the talk. I finished the talk. First person in line is Ruth. She comes up and she says, I'm ready. I said, okay. I said, I want you to close your eyes, picture yourself in this steel room. And I said, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And I said, I just want you to open the door and let him in. And she literally just, you know, closes her eyes and shuts the door. I, I put my hand on top of her head and I prayed this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. That was pretty much it. And she fell out. And this is a very conservative evangelical who's not used to any manifestations of the Holy Spirit whatsoever. But she fell right out, you know, which happens to people in the Bible. 
It happens in the Old Testament to Ezekiel. He falls out. He runs into the kabod, the heavy presence of God, and falls out on his face multiple times. Back in those days, they didn't have catchers. He lands right on his face, right? You know, and you get to the New Testament. It happens to the apostle John, right? Uh, you get to Revelation. He meets Jesus face to face. This is the same John that lays his head on Jesus' breast when he runs into the risen Christ. He falls out like a dead man. The presence of God is so thick. He cannot stand under the weightiness of the Lord's manifest presence. That's what happened to her. And uh, I saw her three months later. You know, I was an adjunct at the time. I wasn't teaching full time. So I went back to Boston where I was pastoring then. And they came back the next time to New York. I see her. She comes running up to me, throws both arms around me and just is a totally different person. And I looked at her and I said to her, all right, you got to tell me what happened. She said, that day unlocked my emotion like never before. She said, the next three months, the last three months, she said, I've been experiencing tons of tears and tons of laughter. She said, it's been like erratic emotions, just up and down. And she said, but now she said, it's kind of, now I got like a normal range of emotions, like they show up when they should. And she said, I, it's completely allowed me to access this full range of emotions for the first time in my life. And I was just an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That's amazing. So in your, in your ministry, it hasn't, uh, if I remember your book correctly, it hasn't always been this way. You haven't always sensed the Holy Spirit's promptings and, and operated within the Holy Spirit's promptings. Um, so what changed? Can you tell us a little bit of your story and, and how that developed in your ministry? Yeah, so two parts. One, um, when I was when I was young, again, I grew up in an evangelical church, word centered, but there was no Holy Spirit stuff in my church growing up. Right? Um, uh, we had I was part of the denomination called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. We had a doctrinal statement that Jesus Christ heals, so we believed in healing, but no one ever got healed in our church. I never saw a healing take place in our church—a miraculous, divine healing, never. Um, so when I was uh, about 19, I, I had an encounter with God where I got, uh, I, it was right after a breakup experience, right after this breakup, I pulled off on the side of the road and I just cried out to God. And when I cried out to him, I had an image. Uh, I don't get a lot of images, but I had an image. I saw Jesus standing there in this image. His hands were wide open towards me, arms wide open. And I, was see, I could see myself in the image, and I was rejecting him, kind of pushing him out of my life. And uh, he said to me, you know, I said to him, I said, you know, this girl broke my heart. And he looked at me and he said to me in this image, he goes, that's the same way you've treated me your whole life. And I surrendered. You know, I, up until that point, Jesus was a part of my life. I added him here and there, you know, but he wasn't at the center of it all. And I just surrendered my life. I just said, from now on, Jesus, you lead. I follow you. You've got me. I'm yours. And when I prayed that prayer, I experienced an overwhelming outpouring of the love of God in my heart. I mean, it was so dramatic. The next day when I went to work, I was working in a restaurant, working my way through college. When I showed up the next day, there was one other believer in the restaurant. As soon as I walked in, she looked at me and she said, you encountered God. Like she could see the difference. And uh, we started having a conversation. So, so by that point on, I started getting these promptings of the Holy Spirit, like a whisper of the Holy Spirit. Before that, I never had any. And then after that encounter with Jesus, it, it started to shift. I started getting some supernatural promptings. So I started ministry. I had a little bit of that kind of stuff. And uh you know, I go to ministry and I believe this stuff and I'm trying to lean into this stuff a little bit by that point. But I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing. Right. But I, I'm learning on the fly. I don't have a church environment where that's taught, where that's experienced. So anyways, one day uh, I was when I was first in ministry, I was the assistant pastor and I was gathering people together, pastors together from our region and the Brockton area where I was, Brockton, Massachusetts, gathering all these pastors from the greater Brockton area, and they were from all different places, man. Um, I had Pentecostals and Baptists and Evangelicals and, you know, Charismatics and just a big broad stream, you know, and so, you know, I gather all these people together, and one day, 
you know, one of this pastor teams calls me up. It was the woman in a husband and wife pastor team. Her name was Diane. She calls me up and she said, hey, Thursday night, our, and she was four square gospel church, right? So classic Pentecostal theology. She calls me up and she's like, hey, our uh, prophetic intercessors are gathering to pray tonight. We'd like you to come out on Thursday night and we're going to pray over you. And I got to tell you, everything inside of me went, no freaking way am I going to a bunch of loony prophetic intercessors praying over me, right? But the problem is I gathered all these pastors together, so I can't say no because this was my doing, right? So now I'm stuck. So I'm like, all right, so... I said, oh, sure, I'll show up. And so I got to tell you, I had to get along with the Lord and figure out why am I resistant to this? And I'll be honest, this was the issue. Uh, As much as I don't want to admit it then, I mean, now it's easy for me. But at that point, I wouldn't have wanted to say it out loud. I had to. This was the issue. I was afraid of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, And you know what? I had to wrestle that down in my spirit. And when I really wrestled it down, this is what I was essentially afraid of. Number one. I was afraid that they were going to reveal some dark secret of my life, right? And first of all, if you actually understand prophecy, that's what we're talking about. Hearing God's voice is just the biblical word for prophecy. That's all it is. And according to 1 Corinthians 14, the purpose of the prophetic is to strengthen, comfort, and encourage, not humiliate and shame and embarrass. So he's not going to reveal something to someone to humiliate you. He's only going to reveal something to someone to benefit you. So I went, okay, so that's not the Holy Spirit anyways. That's just my fear. All right. Second thing I was afraid of, I was, I was afraid of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Like I didn't want it getting weird, you know? And, uh, and on, honestly, yeah, I, I, you know, I had to wrestle this down. And this is what I finally concluded. Fear of the Holy Spirit is demonic. It is a tool of the enemy to keep you from freedom and fullness in Christ, because Jesus is not afraid of the Holy Spirit. So when I have fear of the Holy Spirit, I'm not in alignment with Jesus. And that's what I really had to wrestle down in my life, is I had to get over my fear of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so when I did, you know, it really opened up a lot of stuff to me. John, do you have anything, any questions? Yeah, yeah I, just hearing about your shift from, um, just hearing about your shift from into practicing more of that as part of your life and your ministry and hearing from the Holy Spirit and following God's prompting. I, I was just wondering if you could, if you could give us a picture of, um, cause is that, is that a, is that a steady stream in your life or does it come with peaks and, and valleys or what has that experience been f- like for you in, in, in that sense? Cause I think people listening might be thinking it's the same all the time and maybe it no. is, I don't know, but I just want to hear from yeah, you. On no, that. no, no. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like any other relationship, right? I mean, God's a person you're in relationship with God. Uh, you know, if you're married, you are, you know, and so you realize there's ups and downs and peaks and valleys in any relationship. There's times when you're closer and your communication is really good. And then there's times when there's, you know, it's just distant. You're more distant with one another and you're not emotionally connecting. Well, it's similar with God. The difference is, you know, with God, sometimes one, um, I'm distant from God because of my own junk, right? So it's either my sin or sometimes it's my emotional issues like that. That was fear of the Holy Spirit. That's really what that was. And so that kind of stuff is going to keep you distant. Two, though, sometimes God intentionally distances himself. He does that. You know, uh, John of the Cross called that the dark night of the soul. And that's not about hardship. It's that there are times where God intentionally distances himself and you no longer experience his voice, his presence, and so on with such closeness. And he does it, John says, for the purpose of purgation. That is, he's trying to develop you and take you deeper and purify your soul. And uh, that's legit. So I've had seasons like that where God is distant. Um, some, a lot of times, most of the times by my own doing, 
and then sometimes by God's choice, you know, he's trying to take me deeper. And uh, yeah, so sometimes when I've been through mm -hmm. like a dark night of the soul, his voice was distant, quiet. And then there's times where, you know, I felt like, you know, I was hearing God on a regular basis. And uh, I would say <clears throat> you have to learn how to cultivate his presence and his voice. And you can get better at it. Um, it's kind of like learning a new language. That's awesome. You've talked about, um, you, I've heard you talk about emotions a few times and, and looking back in someone's life and in your own life. Um, and it, it's, I, I want, can you talk a little bit more about the connection there um, between our, our emotional life and our, and our, our life with the Holy Spirit? Yeah. And if you're willing to pitch in a little bit on your, on your views of, of emotional care of other kinds that, you know, it, therapy, counseling, um, yeah. what the role of those can be in, in relationship to it as well. So first, you know, I think uh, most of our barriers towards intimacy with God have to do with our soul issues. And your soul, if you will, is, you know, it's that sort of center place of your being where you have your emotions, your mind, your will. Uh, it's that, you know, core operation in the, in the human being. The soul uh, issues sometimes are emotional issues. So yeah, you can have emotional issues that prevent you from going deep with God and experiencing God and hearing God speak and connecting with God deeply. Um, that happens to all of us. And flip side, uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit communicates to us through emotions. I mean, think about this for a second, just logically and with me with scripture for a second. So we know that the Holy Spirit convicts us. Well, you know, how many of you have ever felt the Holy Spirit's conviction and felt like your inner being was out of whack and you had a lack of peace in your inner being? You felt this angst. It was like you drank too many cups of coffee, right? Well, I mean, that's an emotional thing. He is speaking to you through emotions to let you know you're out of alignment with him. Listen, God never shines light into your inner being to make you feel bad. God shines light into your inner being to bring you back into alignment with him, because when you're in alignment with him, life works better. And so that's why that feeling is there. But it's not a pleasant feeling. Then there's another one you should all have. Peace. We talk about it scripturally multiple times. The Bible talks about a peace that passes human understanding, right? Paul talks about it. Jesus talks about a peace, not as the world gives peace, but I give peace. He's given us peace from heaven. Well, heaven's a superior realm to earth. Therefore, heaven's peace trumps earth's circumstances. Jesus is never nervous. He hasn't had a nervous day in the last two millennial. Today's not his day. COVID-19 ain't making Jesus nervous, okay? It's just not. Uh, what that means is when I'm in alignment with Jesus, his peace is pumped into my inner being and I can live with peace no matter how dark it gets. When I lose peace, it's because of out of alignment with Jesus. So I'm saying that to say emotions sometimes are the way the Holy Spirit speaks, moves and communicates with us. Romans 5 says he pours out the love of God in our hearts. That's not a trickle. It's an outpouring. The word he uses there is this, you know, sort of deep outpouring of God's love. So yeah, he speaks. Part of the fruit of the spirit is joy and so on and so forth. So there is a, there's an emotional component to you that God, I think, doesn't despise because he has it. He created you in his image. That's where you got these emotions from. And he communicates through those things. I'd be careful. Sure. But they're actually a pretty good indicator of a lot of stuff that's going on in your inner being. So you kind of want to pay attention to them. Yeah, so we have support groups um, at the church. And is there anything else you'd like to say to um, to our support group leaders on how to manage things like mental illness or emotional instability, things like that, and how to how to know the difference between spiritual and physical and uh, and those types of questions? Yeah, so I do a ton of deliverance ministries, um, but I also have a lot of friends that are psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on and so forth. And the reality is this stuff's super tricky when you're dabbling into this stuff. I will say this, because you have to have a framework for both. If you don't have a framework for, you know, both the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional, 
um, you're probably going to misdiagnose lots of things. Listen, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, even when it's a screw. And you're not going to beat that sucker in. You know, I don't care what you do. So at the end of the day, you need wisdom. Listen, you know, I read the commentaries, you know, and a lot of commentaries in today's world, you know, are written by modern people. And I mean, people with a modern worldview, and they don't have a worldview for the supernatural. So they write things like this. Well, you know, there weren't really demons in the first century. There was just psychological issues. And I just want to hit the pause button and go, pause. Do you really think you're smarter than Jesus? Really? Do you? Do you think Jesus was a country bumpkin who couldn't discern between a psychological issue and a spiritual issue? Do you really think that? Because I don't want to think that about Jesus. And I don't believe that about Jesus. When Jesus did deliverance, that's because it was necessary. And you know what? When churches don't do deliverance, they're leaving things behind that could have been handled. And they're calling things psychological that were actually spiritual. And so you really have to be able to figure out what is a psychological issue, what is a spiritual issue, you're going to need help. But if you have no framework for one of those particular viewpoints, then you're going to have to get help from someone who does have a worldview and a framework for that. And uh, honestly, our Western worldview has messed up our biblical lenses. So we're missing lots of pieces of the Bible that are really plain for the generation they were written to, but not plain for us today. And that would include this whole spiritual realm and the, and the demonic realm. So, and I could tell you thousands of stories of people that I've done deliverance on that used to have depression that got diagnosed with things like bipolar, but when they actually got deliverance, their anxiety and depression were completely gone. And it was demonic. Just nobody knew that because there was no worldview for that. So yeah, it's there. It's a real world. And uh, you got to be aware of it. Jesus was keenly aware of it. And he operated both in the soul realm as well as in the spirit realm. Yeah. Are there any indicators or cues that you look for? Or how do you go about that process? If somebody comes to you and says they've been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, or is it just where you're listening to the Holy Spirit and, and allowing him to lead and guide? What, uh, what, do you, what is yeah. that? I mean, I'm asking questions. I'm going to ask you your story. And, you know, when I'm listening to your story, I'm going to listen to a couple of key components that I realize are critical components for demonic entry. And so, for example, I mean, you have a history of witchcraft in your family. Your grandmother was a witch who had real power, was able to levitate objects. The chances of you having something there that is spiritual rooted, that is going to create some forms of dysfunction in your family tree, I would say darn near 100%. That's just, a, that's just a guarantee, just about, okay? Uh, I'm going to ask questions about abuse, where there's been sexual abuse. Um, there's usually some forms of demonization. Do you have emotional issues and trauma connected to? Of course, of course, there's soul issues. But does that mean there's not demonic issues? Oh, no, not at all. The story I told about the lady the other day, I mean, just at the beginning here, who you know, is walking across the room and she's experiencing those nighttime visitors. Listen, I do these soul care conferences around the planet. That's a common experience. 50% of people in, in the North America today have been sexually abused, according to the latest statistic. This is a super common statistic, right? Super common issue. So you got lots and lots of people that have weird uh, sexual symptoms that are connected to the demonic. Like, for example, they're in worship and they're getting sexual images they feel really bad they actually feel repulsed by it they don't want it but it keeps coming and then they feel condemned by it well you know when there's sexual abuse in the history yeah that's what happens you know that kind of stuff shows up and if you will get some deliverance you could get free from that kind of stuff um, one of the things resource wise uh, yeah, my book Soul Care is a little bit in there, but if you go to a Soul Care conference or I'm doing deliverance training conferences, those are really good resources to help kind of differentiate some of the spiritual and some of the psychological and emotional issues. Yeah, appreciate that. Sorry, it's big, big question, short time. Um, a lot of these are. Um, so going back, uh, rewinding a little bit, um, you're talking about 
just developing this inner life of walking with the Holy Spirit. What are a few suggestions that you have for all of us to, to, to listen to the Spirit and to develop this inner life? Yeah, so a couple things. First, um, you got to figure out how God speaks, right? So again, it's like learning a foreign language. You know, anybody who only speaks English, like me, for me to go to a foreign country, it just, I don't understand anything that's going on around me. I, but if I lived in a foreign country for three months, slowly, I would begin to pick up some language, not like a little kid would pick it up. They'd pick it up super quick, right? I'd pick it up slow because I'm an old goat, but I'd pick it up slowly and I would start to piece together sentences and you'd start to make sense of it. Well, when you're learning how to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, as Paul says, yeah, it's, it's also learning how to hear his voice. So I like to say there's six ways God speaks. Now, I'm not talking about through the Bible. Let me just start by saying, yes, God speaks by the Bible. Okay, as a matter of fact, if you hear a prompting, whisper, leading, prophetic word from the Holy Spirit that disagrees with the Bible, it's not God, period. So, you know, it's got to agree with Scripture. We got to test everything. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians 5 when he talks about the prophetic, test everything. But here's the six ways, the basic ways. One, God speaks in an audible voice. Happens in the Bible. People hear the audible voice of God. Jesus, as a matter of fact, on at least two occasions, his baptism and transfiguration, hears the audible voice of God. When I go to speak to a crowd, I will ask this question frequently. How many of you have ever heard the audible voice of God? Almost always, it's at least a quarter of the room. And uh, it's funny, I've been to churches that are cessationist churches, right, where they don't believe in the supernatural, they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, don't believe the Holy Spirit speaks, ask that question, and still 10% of the crowd will raise their hand, right? And, uh, you know, God trumps bad theology a lot. And so one of the things that I can tell you is, uh, yeah, the Holy Spirit sometimes speaks audibly. I've heard the audible voice of God once in my life, woke me up in the middle of the night, um, it was an unforgettable moment, Okay. Uh, second, sometimes God uses your thoughts. This is probably that may be the most common. And, you know, you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you get a thought pop into your head. Oh, I should call Jim. And you think, oh, yeah, I haven't talked to Jim in a long time. I should call Jim. And the thought pops in again, call Jim. And, you know, you wrestle with it for a little while. You finally give in. You make the phone call and you discover it was unbelievable, uncanny timing, right? So it's just the Holy Spirit prompting, but he's just guiding your thoughts. That's what he's doing. And third, um, sometimes he uses pictures. Acts chapter two, you know, in the last days, which biblically speaking is from the time Jesus rose till the time, I mean, yeah, from the time Jesus died till the time Jesus returns, that's the last days. And so we're in the last days. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> he says in the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. And if you read it, they're going to prophesy, but specifically, they're going to have dreams and visions, young and old, male and female. Okay, those are pictures. Pictures when you're asleep or when you're awake. Dream, obviously, you're sleeping, and you know when you're awake, a vision. It's a picture. And so some people get pictures. Uh, some people, that's the way they commonly, most commonly hear the Lord. Uh, fourth, um, sometimes you get a word in your mind's eye. You can just see a word. It's just spelled out in your mind's eye. That one happens to people sometimes. I've had that before. Fifth, um, sometimes you get something in your body or your emotions. I said before that story about the woman that was abused, I felt two colliding emotions, God's ferocity and God's tender affections, the father's tender affections. That collision of emotions was what tuned me into what she was experiencing. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've literally walked into a room and felt someone was carrying sadness. I don't know them at all, but I can feel their sadness. And uh, I was in a restaurant one day and this waitress came by and I said to the people I was with my wife and a friend, and I just said, anybody sense that she's carrying sadness? And they're all looking at me going, no, she like, seems really happy. I go, nah, she's carrying sadness. I said, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And they're all like, oh no, here we go. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 relax. So we connect with her over the meal, just, you know, back when you used to be able to go to restaurants, but, you know, so we're having a good time with her chatting and then, you know, get to the end of this thing. And I just looked at her and I, you know, I said to her, hey, I said, can I ask you a question? She said, sure. I said, from the moment you walked in, I, I perceived that you were carrying sadness. 
and she started bawling. And you see, because I have discernment, I realized she was carrying sadness. You know, that's what discernment does for you. It's a gift. Not everybody gets it, right? And, uh, you know, I just see the sadness all over her. So by the way, she ran out of the restaurant and my wife looks at me and he goes, now what? I go, she'll be back. And she did. She came back, you know, sat down next to me in the booth. And she's like, how did you know who told you? I'm like, God did. And she's like, God did? I'm like, yeah. I said, you know, listen, I said, I, I, I'm, I'm somebody that tries to walk with Jesus. And I could feel this sadness coming from you. I said, it's connected to your family, isn't it? And again, it's just coming. And uh, she's like, yeah. And uh, so anyways, she just looked at me and said, I can't do this. She said, I'm in, I'm supposed to be working. And I said, you know what? Let me just say one thing to you before you go. I said, the reason the Lord showed it to me is because he wants you to know you're not alone in this and he cares. That's it. You know, it was just one encounter, but I could feel it. And sometimes you'll get that. And lastly, sometimes it just comes straight to my knower. And when it comes to my knower, it's just like, I didn't see anything, hear anything, feel anything. I just knew something. It feels like it comes from here up rather than from here down or to my emotions. And it's just, I just know something. That's what happens. And that one happens to me quite a bit. Um, and whenever you get one of these, you got to test it. So the first thing you got to do is know how God speaks. The second thing you, you got to practice. So, you know, for me, the first thing I did once I started hearing God, I would literally every day sit alone with the Lord with a, back then a pen and a paper. And I would just sit before the Lord and say, is there anything you want to say to me today? And whatever I sensed, I would write it down and then I would test it. You always have to test it humbly. And so I test it with the Bible. Is this true? Does this seem what, you know, consistent with scripture? And if I needed to, I would test it with other believers who had a track record of hearing God's voice. And uh, so you got to practice, know how he speaks and then practice. In, in that, um, in that process, of, as I'm hearing you communicate with people in you know, that example of the, of the server at the restaurant, it, it, just for people who are in that, maybe in that process where they're, they're practicing, right? Are there any tips on, on, are there phrases that you av avoid using, for instance? Are, are there things that you try to keep out of your, your lingo um, and a little bit of what those might be and, and the heart behind it? Yeah. So one, I, I never, ever use the phrase, the Lord said, the Lord told me um, when I'm talking to you. Why? Well, because John, if I'm wrong, I don't give you an option. You either listen to me or you're disobeying God. So that's not humility. So what I do is I would just say to you, I sense this, or I hear this, or I feel this. Does that mean anything to you? And if you say no, then I go, that's probably just what I ate for dinner. It happens. We miss stuff. The difference between Old Testament prophetic and New Testament prophetic is a pretty giant gap. In the Old Testament, you know, if a prophet didn't get 100% of the, the prophetic word correct, they stoned them. But in the New Testament, all God's people get to prophesy. Remember what he said in, in Acts chapter 2. I'll pour out my spirit and all my people will prophesy. You go to, you know, Corinthians, where he's dealing with 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, largest New Testament discourse on the prophetic, right? And, you know, this is an opportunity for the, for the people of God to hear the voice of God. And he's given instructions about how that works. John 14 through John 16, largest New Testament teaching on the Holy Spirit that Jesus does. This huge discourse on the Holy Spirit. But notice the verbs in there. The Holy Spirit will convict you, speak to you, lead you, guide you. He will reveal to you, make known to you, teach you. Those are all communication verbs. What Jesus is saying is, listen, the Holy Spirit speaking to all of us. But we got to dial into his presence and to his voice. And so I'm pretty careful when I give somebody a prophetic word. I'm pretty careful to say, I sense this. Does that mean anything to you? I'm going to test it with you. And if you say no, I trust you. I trust the Holy Spirit in you. I can be wrong. So I just let it go. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Rob. I love it. I appreciate how you approach this conversation so much. So thank you. Um, uh, I think one last question. I want to leave time for everybody to uh, ask some questions. But what does it what does it look like 
to incorporate this into a community setting. So you said when you brought this in, you it wrestled with it personally, all of this stuff. And what did it look like when you brought this into your church setting when you were pastoring? Yeah. So first, John, I taught about this kind of stuff, right? I mean, I, I was teaching on these kinds of things, but the problem was it's not sufficient just to teach it. You have to equip people. One of the grave mistakes of the church in this generation is we teach without equipping. Jesus equipped Ephesians tells us that the work of pastors and leaders in the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Well, equipping involves something more than teaching. It's not just teaching. So if you think about Jesus equipping and coaching of his disciples, one of the things that always involved is experience. So one of the things I realized was I couldn't just teach it. I had to give them experience. So when I started bringing this into a local church setting where I was really realized I had to equip it, it wasn't enough just to teach it, I went, okay, I need to find lab time, like lab space, where I can create a safe environment for people to begin to experience the things of the Holy Spirit. So I called up a friend and I said to him, is Dr. Martin Sanders, he's the head of our doctoral program at ATS now. And at the time, he kind of had my role at Alliance Theological Seminary. He was the professor of pastoral theology. So I called him up and I said to him, hey, bud, listen, I'm thinking about doing something new with my church. I want to teach on the Holy Spirit and then give him lab time. So I want to teach on how to hear God's voice. And then I'm going to give him a lab space. And what we would do is break them into th groups of three people that they didn't know anyone. And that was really important because, see, if I'm getting together with my wife, Jen, I could give her all kinds of prophetic words that aren't really prophetic, okay? There's just stuff that I know. You know, you're, I think the Holy Spirit is saying you need to change this in your life, right? Yeah, that's not really prophetic. That's called pathetic, not prophetic. And so I'm like, this is really not the way I want to do this thing. So I, I made them get with people they didn't know. I'd have them listen. So we just introduce each other's names. So let's say you had Tim, Bob, and and Janet, right? And we're all sitting there. We start by praying for Janet. And so Tim and Bob wait, they listen. If they get something, they would test it humbly. They'd say to Janet, hey, I hear this. Does that mean anything to you? I feel this. I see this. Does that mean anything to you? Well, I gotta tell you, when that kind of stuff happened in that environment and, and God came, you knew it was God because you had no natural knowledge of this person's life at all. So I kept setting them up with experience. We taught them how to pray for sick people. Then we had all the sick people get up and they were the prayer team. We just equipped them how to pray for the sick. And then we literally coached them through the process. They'd pray for the sick and sick people would get healed and we would see miracles. Um, I trained them how to do deliverance and then I would do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm equipping them to do the works of the kingdom and in the power of the Holy Spirit with sensitivity to the presence and voice of the Holy Spirit. That's really what I did. Those lab spaces were absolutely essential. It's not enough just to teach it. You have to equip it. And so that's what, that's really what we did. And then we coached them. If they did it poorly, we, you know, we'd kind of come alongside, put our arm around them, love them, but coach them where they needed some coaching. Thanks for sharing, Rob. Um, I've got a million other questions, but I think we'll let everyone else ask some questions. So Kim, Michael, and Kathleen, if you guys have any questions, or Kitty, if any questions came in from the text line, or if you have any questions either, um, feel free to ask them. So does anybody have any questions for Rob? I do. Um, what do you do with prophetic messages that just offhand feel like they're negative? How do you approach those? Yeah. Um, yeah. So first, the purpose of prophecy, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the purpose of prophecy is to strengthen, comfort, and encourage. The motive is love. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, again, it's the greatest New Testament teaching on the prophetic. Right in the middle of this teaching is the love chapter. I know we read it at weddings. It has nothing to do with weddings. It has to do with the prophetic. It has to do with supernatural charismatic gifts, okay? What his point is, is this. The church at Corinth 
was very selfish with their exercise of spiritual gifts. The gift they favored was the gift of tongues. They felt like, well, if you everybody spoke in tongues, well, that brought you to a new spiritual echelon, right? And so they were haughty with this gift. Paul goes, listen, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but I would much rather give a prophetic word because it will edify the body. And the purpose of the gifts is not self-serving to make you look better. It is to strengthen, comfort, encourage. The motive is to love well. So one of the ways you test whether something is authentic prophetic is whether or not it strengthens, comforts, encourages, and makes you feel loved. Now, some of that stuff's just training, okay? Some of it, the person actually does get an authentic prophetic word, but they are really lousy at delivering it in a way that strengthens, comforts, encourages, and makes you feel loved. And that's training. That's equipping. So, you know, there's times where the Lord gives me a really tough word for someone. And my job as a person who loves Jesus and loves them is to figure out how I can get that word to them in a way that's building them up and not tearing them down. That's my job. And if I can't figure out how to get it there, I won't give it. I'm not going to give a word that's toxic or destructive because that's not the purpose of prophecy. That would be in disalignment with the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to do that. Does that make sense? So for me, if I'm the receiver of a word like that, I actually do the reverse. I sit back and I go, okay, the person who delivered the word was immature in their delivery. But is there anything authentic in this word for me? Because I can be mature even if you're immature. And so even if you give it in an immature way, I can receive it with maturity. So then I'm going to humble myself before the Lord and I'm going to say, Lord, is there anything in this word for me? And I didn't handle it in a way that was loving and constructive, but is there anything there for me? And if the Lord doesn't show me any way to bring this thing into my life, I will sometimes take it to a couple of close friends who really have my best interest in mind. And I'll say, someone said this, do you think there's anything to that? Please tell me the truth and do it in a way that's loving. And I'll test it there. And if I get past those two, then I flush it. I let it go. But I do my best to both give them with humility, but also receive them with humility. And I don't do it perfectly by any means. Any others with a question? I have one. Go for it. All right. Um, so I, I hear your experiences and um, I'm, you know, still learning on the, on, on all all these on, on this perspective, I you know I kind of grew up in a different way um, in my in my early church life, but I've come to understand that I don't really know really a lot. But um, one one thing that I, I thought was an interesting thought, I was listening to uh, a sermon from John Piper, and it was called um, uh, I, f I forget exactly what it was called, but it was like uh, our spiritual gifts for today. And one one of the things that he said was an argument against it was. Um, church history and and that there wasn't a lot of a, a lot of um, uh, these miraculous things going on uh, as church history was was coming around. It wasn't until like around the twentieth century, where um, early twentieth century, where it really the 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 gifts and the wonders and gifts and signs were really being more brought to the surface. I guess what would you say to somebody? We're having we're having some issues, Louis, with your uh, with your stream. But I understand I think you, got, you got the spirit of the question, Rob. If you want to go I ahead, do. yeah. So, um, bottom line is, I would say first, uh, I didn't hear Piper's talk, so you know, I I can't speak to that. But I will speak to the question of this stuff doesn't occur in church history. I would say that's not true. This stuff has always occurred in church history. Um, it's just in pockets. Um, so when you read church history, you will see at certain times there was a revival that would take place and the supernatural often gets awakened during times of renewal. What you're looking at, sadly, is the church is often in an unrenewed state. And when the church is in an unrenewed state, you're missing a lot of essential pieces that should be normative to the church. So um, I would say that's not really true, that it's not been there as part of church history. Um, 
Yeah, I've studied the history of revivals, and I would say almost every revival you look at in history has experienced a component of supernatural activity. That was true in the first and second Great Awakenings with Wesley and, and Jonathan Edwards. Uh, listen, Jonathan Edwards' wife was slain in the spirit. You know, I mean, they didn't use that phrase back then. Um, you talk about holy laughter, right? So one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit sometimes is holy laughter. And, you know, so I've heard people criticize and say that only occurred in the 20th century, but that's not actually true. The first great awakening, for example, there were people that would just burst into gales of laughter and unstoppable laughter under the weightiness of the Holy Spirit. They just didn't call it holy laughter, but they described the phenomenon. Wesley describes it in his journals. You get to the second great awakening under Charles Finney, and, and he describes it again, the same things. And, uh, you know, when you finally see it appear in history as holy laughter was by a man named John Praying Hyde in the 1800s, late 1800s. And uh, he actually is the one who coins the phrase holy laughter. So it wasn't a 20th century Pentecostal thing. It was in, you know, part of awakenings throughout the history of the church. And so what I would say is lots of times when the Holy Spirit gets awakened in our midst, then some of the supernatural phenomenon with the Holy Spirit gets awakened as well. Rob, I, I appreciate Thanks for that. Yeah, I think you might be the only person to ever link Jonathan Edwards and laughter, but well done. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> do we have any other questions, guys? I was wondering, um, am I on? Yeah. I was wondering uh, what you think of the current pandemic situation and how the Holy Spirit is working. Do you can you foresee um, a great awakening happening now um, as people are their lives are turned, their lives are are scary, their hearts are softened? Um, what do you see? Yeah, actually, I just wrote a book on this, which I'm going to publish at the end of this week, probably. Um, calling it calm in the storm. And the reality is, I do think that this is an unprecedented kingdom opportunity. If you look at the history of the church, revival has mostly occurred during times of difficulty, suffering, famine, persecution, and warfare. It very seldom has occurred in times of comfort, ease, and peace. That's not usually when the Spirit comes. So even think about the book of Acts, right? So when does the Spirit really break out in its most significant uh, unleashing in the book of Acts? It's actually when the persecution starts. And they were all gathered in Jerusalem, right? But as soon as the persecution starts, they spread, and the Word of God spreads like wildfire. And... Uh, China this century, you know, this last century, you know, uh, people that were there that were missionaries on the ground. And I knew some of the missionaries that were there when they got kicked out, you know, as uh, in my younger years, most of them have died now, but um, they said, you know, they weren't sure what was going to happen to China when they left. They really didn't know when they went back in and they had found the church was exploding. They were shocked. It happened in Vietnam, the Christian Missionary Alliance, my own denomination. You know, we got kicked out of Vietnam. We were in there. We had some martyrs, you know, some missionaries that got martyred. We disappear totally. Uh, we come back in 20 years later. We have no idea if we're going to find a decimated church. If there's anything left of the church, the church had exploded, exploded. It's now our largest in our Christian Missionary Alliance family. It's our largest field. So this is an unprecedented kingdom opportunity, but the church must get ready if we're going to be used in that way. And part of what happens before revivals really break loose to become awakenings, when it shifts to an awakening, it opens up a community. And when it shifts... The church has to be purged and mobilized, purged, deeply purged from the self-life, from be, making it way too much about us, but then mobilized on mission. And I think there's potential in this thing. Sure, I do. I think there is potential. 
I think the reality is with the fear that's in the air, the church is going to have to purge from fear. Um, Comfort-based societies, we get a little too attached to the comforts. We're going to have to become more attached to the eternal. And uh, if those kinds of things take place, yeah, I do. I think it could be an incredible opportunity. That's great. I, I'll go one more time. Um, can you speak to people who have had um, maybe a, a bad experience, a, a bad word was given to them, or someone just wasn't gracious or whatever? Uh, we have plenty of people like that in our church, so if you could just take sure. a minute. I've had bad experiences, too. Um, so John Wimber, I believe it was, had this phrase, which I love, and I'm pretty sure it was Wimber, and this is what he said. He said, the right answer to abuse is not disuse, but right use. That's a really good word. So the right answer to abuse is not disuse. That's usually how the pendulum swings. We go, oh, this is bad. So we just throw it out and go, we can't do that. Instead, what we need to do is go, the right answer to abuse isn't disuse, but right use. What it should lead us to is correct practices. So we want to be careful how we teach it. We want to be careful how we equip people in it. Um, for example, probably one of the great abuses of the prophetic is people don't test it. They walk up to each other and go, the Lord told me, and then they let someone have it. It really wasn't the Lord at all. It was just they were ticked at the person and they just were sloppy in their communication and just blamed God for their anger. Uh, the reality is um, this stuff should always be done with humility and testing. So that's part of equipping and you have to help people to do that. All right. Well, uh, in order to respect your time, Rob, it's after 830. So um, we can call it. Thank you guys for asking the questions and thank you, Rob, for joining us. Again, we really appreciate your time and your insight and the conversation um, that you started here. So uh, thank you. You bet you guys. Good to be with you. All right. Have a good night. See you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we, we will be unpacking this a little more over the course of the next week. We want to hear from you guys if you have questions and things like that. Um, we will be back tomorrow night. The topic is hell. So uh, we are going to keep going with these. With these, I mean, it's called Tough Topics for a reason. So uh, we're so excited about, about where it's headed. And um, we can't wait to unpack some of this stuff with you guys. So thanks so much for being, being with us.